Well, when 2015 started, Stephen Harper was confident that waiting till October 19th for an election was the right thing to do. Some in his party wondered, with signs of an oncoming faltering economy, that that maybe waiting wasn't such a good idea. Was that the biggest mistake of the political year? I know you rely on the at issue year ender to answer challenging questions like that. And so here we go. Andrew is here, of course, and so is Chantel. And so is Huffington Post, Ottawa Bureau Chief Althea Raj, and Jennifer Ditchburn of Canadian Press. Okay, I want you to have fun with this, if you can. So let's start. The most positive political story of the year. We're always criticized for being negative, so we're going to start with what we think was the most positive political story of the year, Andrew? Uh, the election, and I mean that in the most nonpartisan possible way. I mean, I have my difficulties with some of the li liberal election promises, and they're having their own difficulties with them since they've been elected. But the way in which they won, I think, is a good news story. They, it, they showed you can win by being positive. You can win by having lots of uh, meaty ideas in your platform. You can win by taking risks. All kinds of things that some of the political pros might have said, oh, you can never win that way. Uh, that's a good news story. And good hair. <laughs> Good so hair, you can win with good hair. You can win of with good hair. Of course, you would notice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that. You said to have fun. <laughs> yes. Not at my expense. That wasn't the idea. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, renewed voter engagement. Uh, all these uh, more than two million new voters who showed up, the highest turnout in, in a few decades, which is encouraging because it, it, it means the election campaign actually communicated to voters that uh, it didn't happen for the junkies uh, uh, and that people really got engaged and went out to vote. And I have to say, uh, there is a lot of, of pride on the part of a lot of voters for having participated in the election. And that's also rare. Some elections, people go home in the morning after they see the results and no one has voted for the winner. In this case, even people who voted for losers uh, think that it was an interesting democratic exercise. I'll see you. Uh, I went with the Syrian refugees, the arrival of the Syrian refugees. I think that, you know, you had a national project that the country seems to have uni unified itself around. Uh, it's a really nice positive story, especially around Christmas. And, you know, what's more positive than giving people a second chance at life? Those are all very good answers. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about the most positive political event that I covered. And I'd have to say, without a doubt, it was the the swearing-in ceremony. I can't remember, going back years, any event that had so much sort of joyfulness and happiness. And I, I think it's because they let the public in. And so the, the public felt, and this is sort of linked to what you were saying, the public felt that they had a, an, um, they were vested in, in that swearing-in. They were participating. And, and remember the two Inuit throat singers mm -hmm. giggling? I mean, there was a certain joyfulness about that whole event. More importantly, more substantively, the fact that there was this gender parity that was brought in, and I know that's been discussed quite a bit, but look back on it a month later, and we have some pretty spectacular women on the, the front benches, on the opposition side as well. That's so that right. was a very positive development that came out of that. You know the throat singers you mentioned? Yes. I, I don't know how many times you've seen throat singing. I, I've seen a lot of having spent a lot of time up north. And it is remarkable the number of times um, when young women and elderly Inuit women are doing throat singing that they end up breaking out laughing in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. it it's almost part of the process. It's quite... Uh, Fascinating to watch. All right, most ignored political issue of the year. Chantel, you start. Oh, yeah, because uh, I find that an arbitrary question, considering the range of topics that were discussed <laughs> over the course of the election, right. uh, to go and say, well, you missed that one. Mm -hmm. I, I thought we covered, possibly because of the length of the election and the pre-election uh, writ period, there are issues we didn't discuss, the aging of Canada's population. I could go down the list, but I will remember this here for all the issues that we actually did talk about. All right. Uh, Althea, uh, well, try to get us on focus here. On <laughs> I think we should have talked about the aging population. Yeah. And, you know, there was a news hook actually during the campaign when Statistics Canada announced that there were more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15. And the fact that we didn't really talk about that, we didn't really talk about our lack of innovation and the fact that we're saddling my generation and the generation behind me uh, with massive health care costs that we have no idea how we're going to pay for, uh, that we are just, there's this ticking time bomb uh, that nobody wanted to address. I don't know if it's because senior voters don't like to talk about that and they vote, but uh, there was an opportunity there that we missed. Jennifer. 
uh, climate change. I think that um, we've been talking about it for the past month, six weeks, but before that, it was barely an issue during the election campaign. And um, there's uh, so many things for Canada to, to tackle. Uh, agriculture, the impact on agriculture, the impact on the north, the food supply, whether we're going to uh, take advantage of the economic possibilities that come with sustainable types of energy. Uh, and it surprised me that during the election campaign, it, was, it really wasn't discussed very much. Andrew. Uh, there was a couple of issues that we knew were going to be coming up and we somehow skated through the whole election without really talking about them. One was climate change was a third, but electoral reform, but also assisted suicide. And these are both issues now that we're now addressing, now that we have a new government. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're realizing that we really didn't uh, necessarily think through some of the implications and we're going to have to have a big national conversation about both of them uh, now. Maybe you don't want to be talking about assisted suicide or in the context of a competitive election campaign though. Well you can argue that both ways that's right I mean obviously the parties themselves didn't want to mm -hmm. and it could it, it could be demagogued like many issues could on the other hand it, it's one of those occasions when everyone's kind of paying attention but one way or another we didn't and now we're going to have to uh, I hope have a good long full discussion about it. All right. This one is uh, on the big picture of the 2015 campaign. What was, what was perhaps the, the main lesson of the 2015 campaign? Can you, and can you frame it in a sentence, Althea? Hard work pays off. Um, the Liberals plotted out their sort of field organization. Essentially, they built an organization out of scratch. Um, and it essentially delivered them their majority government. Not the win. I think the win would have happened without their field organization, but they say it was worth seven to nine points in competitive races, and that's what gave them the majority win. But unlike, for example, the NDP, which I think actually started to believe the spin that they were giving journalists, um, they, you know, those open nominations we were very critical of, they brought tons of people new to the party. Uh, they had candidates, not just months, but in some cases years beforehand, knocking on doors, identifying their support, and uh, they worked really hard, and they won. Part of that field organization was the reason that the turnout was so much higher. Yes, than absolutely. The last they time brought around, in those new hundreds voters. of thousands of new voters. Right. Uh, Jennifer. That you don't need to let uh, the critics or the pundits dictate what's a political taboo, that you can uh, speak your mind and own it. And uh, I think that the liberals did that. They, they talked about deficits, um, they, they talked about carbon tax. They said, I don't care if you say I can't talk about it, we're, we're going to talk about it. And I, I think that, that that made an impact. Uh, it turned things on its head, and it, it was a successful strategy for them. Andrew. Uh, campaigns matter, and every campaign is different. Um, so the NDP, I think, came into this with the wrong idea as clearly as to what, how this campaign was going to unfold. I think they thought it was going to be a two-party race. The Liberals were just going to drop off the map and not be a, a factor. And they didn't adjust. They didn't, couldn't adjust, it seemed like, when it became clear the Liberals were not going away. Uh, and they were clearly caught with the, the wrong game plan. Chantal. Uh, two things, that contempt is a poor basis for strategic analysis, and I think both the Conservatives and uh, the NDP suffered from uh, looking at Justin Trudeau with contempt. He's not good enough, so we're going to deal with him early on. Mm -hmm. But also that uh, aspirational politics actually does sell better than wedge politics. Uh, and this is the second election where we see that that, that, that Jack Layton recipe, uh, Justin Trudeau borrowed some of it. It paid off for Layton in Quebec in 2011, and it paid off handsomely for Trudeau this year. Okay, I'm going to divide this one up. Just two of you answer this one. Jennifer, we'll start with you. Biggest gaffe or mistake for any party or leader this year? Uh, the Conservatives, with the long campaign and the many debates, they just gave... Justin Trudeau, a huge long runway <laughs> uh, heading into the election. Okay, Andrew. Well, sort of teeing up to my last question, um, when the NDP announced on August the 25th when they were at their peak in the polls that they were going to balance the budget not just over the course of the government but in every year, I think they thought this was the, the master stroke, this was going to close the deal, and it was really the beginning of the unraveling of their campaign because that's what gave the opening for the Liberals to jump to their left and to really say we're the party of change and they're the party of more of the same. All right, best MP who lost in the election, uh, Althea. Um, I was going to say, well, Malcolm Allen, who 
I thought that people are going to say some big names is going to go with a small per not he's like he's a small person, but a lesser known <laughs> person. Uh, Malcolm Allen is uh, the NDP MP for Welland in Ontario. He's a lovely person. He was a great agriculture critic. He was an MP who delivered two private members' bill. One that essentially saved the Legion $780,000 on GST and HST costs on the poppies by eliminating that. Another one he prevented essentially Carla Homolka from uh, ever attempting to get a pardon. Uh, he convinced the Conservative government at the time to sort of adopt his private member's bill and split a government mm -hmm. bill. Very few MPs actually accomplished a lot. And uh, here is somebody that, you know, doesn't have the headlines, like maybe Megan Leslie or Peter Stauffer on election day, but he was a good MP and he lost. Chantal. I picked the Conservative Stephen Fletcher from Manitoba, uh, in part because we are going to have this discussion about the uh, right to die legislation and medically assisted mm -hmm. suicide. And this is someone who is is literally at the mercy uh, of the kindness of strangers if he did want to go that route because he's had this terrible accident. He was a strong voice of reality uh, in that debate on the conservative benches, and I think that voice will be missed over the next year as we discuss and debate this issue. All right, Andrew, on this one, what is the hardest election promise for the government to keep? I think it's, there's several, but I think it's going to be electoral reform. Uh, you know, they have to be very careful of um, not being or seeing to be ramming uh, the thing through the, the, the model that they might prefer, and everyone thinks preferential ballot would be their preferred model. Uh, at the same time, they are, they have a very, you know, black letter promise of this will be the last election, the last one we just had uh, under the first past the post. So they'd be hard pressed not to deliver on this. They've got a whole raft of questions, not just about what model to choose and how to arrive at that model, but also how should we ratify that? Should we have a referendum? If so, under what set of rules? So what kind of question? There's a lot of pitfalls, a lot of ways for this to blow up in their face. It's going to be a real challenge for them. And it's going to, I think it's going to dominate the next year. Just imagine. Dominating the year with electoral Excellent. reform discussions. <laughs> Can't wait. Jennifer. Um, repairing Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. I think that's a, it's, a, it's ambitious, but there's a, it's a, a very tall order, and they're going to have to focus and concentrate, and they're going to have to spend money uh, and keep the concentration on. And I think that that's what happened with the Harper government, that they started off saying they were going to do a bunch of stuff, and it sort of fell off. So think about everything they have to do. Education, treaties... Uh, they say that they're going to end boil water advisories in five years. Uh, it's going to take a lot, a lot of work. That's the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. And they said they will enact all of them. All right. Right. Well, so. not all of them are within their purview. It would be to, good if they... Be, like, right. <laughs> that didn't stop them. <laughs> no, but no. if they actually were, if they could actually get some cross-partisan work on this, so that get the opposition parties to work together on this one issue, I think that would probably help a lot. All right. We've only got a minute before we do it, take a break, so we'll do this quickly. Name your number one UMP to watch. Any party, backbench, frontbench. Harajit Sajjan, the new defense minister. Any particular reason? He has a lot on his plate. Mm -hmm. He's an interesting character. Uh, I feel like he and like the health minister, Jane Philpott, are people who are not traditional politicians in that uh, they ha they're very genuine and honest people, and I think they will have a hard, trouble, a hard time adapting uh, to some of the uh, sort of uh, pressure points that we often in the media try to push them under. Chantal. I picked uh, Justice Minister Jolie Wilson-Raybould uh, because of the number of files she'll handle, but also because she is from the First Nations. I thought that was the most interesting uh, cabinet appointment that Trudeau made because it was counterintuitive uh, rather than give her uh, Indian affairs. And he has also convinced me over the past three weeks that this may be the first prime minister I cover who actually really means to change uh, the, the, the picture on that front. That's a huge challenge. There aren't a lot of votes in there, and she's going to be part of that. There were a lot of votes in this campaign from that area, which helped in terms of those new voters. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're right, the challenge, both you and Jennifer on that challenge, um, I'm out of time, but we're going to do it anyway, Andrew. Uh, Bill Morneau, I mean, it is highly unusual to have a rookie MP as mm -hmm. your finance minister. I mm -hmm. think you have to go back 100 years to find the last one. It might not have seemed such a big file. I mean, it's always a big file to be a finance minister, but, it, but it's, it's become suddenly in the last few weeks, it's apparently a much tougher file than maybe they banked on. To get to it, one of their moving targets uh, for, the, for the deficit is going to be a, a real challenge. Jennifer. Democratic Institutions Minister Mariam Monsef, uh, 30 years old, came to Canada as a refugee from Afghanistan, 
I was impressed in the house. This person has no no experience as a politician, and she she had dignity and she, with humor. She dealt with question period with humor, and she was being challenged by a veteran MP on the other side. No nervousness, no, no. No, it's amazing. Sure anyway, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you be nervous yeah. on the on the floor of the House of Commons? I, I I'm going to have fun watching her. All right. Time for that quick break. But when we come back, this question. What was the most ridiculous, what were they thinking moment of the campaign? And welcome back to the At Issue Year Ender. Andrew, Chantel, Jennifer, and Althea all still here. Here's our last question. Most ridiculous, what were they thinking moment of the election campaign, Jennifer. I've seen lots of cheesy things at election campaigns, <laughs> but the Conservatives, Price is Right, ka-ching, ka-ching, you know, with the dollars down, which they did at every event for about a week. Oh, my God. That was embarrassing. <laughs> and you were there, right? Yeah, oh. like you saw some and of these things. Yeah, yes. Oh, it was over a week, and, and every time you're just cringing. Why are they doing this? It's very tacky. Spe campaign speeches are all the same, most often, you know, in every city they go to. But for reporters traveling with them, they really can start to look a little boring after a while. Uh, Althea. That was not boring. But he looked like he was having so much fun. <laughs> Stephen Harper dropping the, or watching the families drop the money. Uh, my what were they thinking moment is the rally with Rob Ford. At which they did the money <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> you almost got the sense that uh, they had two rallies in the Toronto area. One in Oakville for all the MPs and candidates who were uh, totally embarrassed about maybe sharing the stage with Rob Ford and his family. So we had the Lisa Rates and the Stella Amblers. And then the Rob Ford rally, which organizers told me they expected 7,000 people and they got, you know, less than 2,000. That I just, you know... You know you're sinking down low when you've got to reach out for the Fords. Nobody's really explained that one yet, have they? As to why. They, they thought it could drive the vote up. They yeah. wanted a rally, like the Liberals' Brampton rally, and they thought the Fords could get people out, and they couldn't. Don't tell. It's not wacky, but it's the Conservatives and the kneecap issue. Uh, and the day after the Prime Minister announced this free trade deal uh, that uh, had a lot of potential uh, to show his economic record and he gave an interview and brought it all back to the kneecap as if it was the thing that was most important. How can you spend more than a decade trying to work inside uh, Canada's cultural communities to make yourself the party of the cultural communities and spend an entire campaign saying we are good at doing the us versus them uh, and it's not you, so don't worry, vote for us. I couldn't figure it out and I thought it was a what were, are they thinking moment. Andrew, I, just to even top that, I think the barbaric cultural practices snitch line. Even the people involved, you know, Chris Alexander and Kelly Leach, I think looked sheepish and embarrassed as they were doing it. Uh, the reaction, particularly in, in Ontario, I think was people just, even people who were sort of prepared to put up with the kneecap discussion just thought, this is way over the top. Mm -hmm. Uh, it absolutely reminded, I think, people who might have been softening on the Conservatives mid-campaign when they were actually doing quite well. Uh, they reminded those voters of why they disliked them and I think probably accelerated the process of, okay, let's just vote for whoever can defeat these guys. I think you can track the voters, the, the last, you know, gasp of the Tory campaign from that day on. You know, all four of you are great writers. There's a book there somewhere in your four choices as to how it got to that, that they, that they went these ways on so many... Well, things for one thing, because the they ran critical the critical part of the campaign. You know, what they was the conservative message in this campaign beyond these kinds of, of stunts and phony issues? They didn't have a platform. They thought they could win on the economy, and they couldn't, and so they moved over to security. All right. It's a topic oh, a for another discussion. Mm, well, I'll wait for the book for one minute. <laughs> all right. Written. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great holidays. Thank you, too. Stay with us over the holidays, and on December 23rd, we'll have a special ad issue dealing with your questions. You send in lots, we'll try to answer as many as we can.